Hi everyone, uh, today we're going to be studying dynamics uh, and beginning to move into the second part of the course. Dynamics is the study of forces and in many ways this is the core idea of the course. So we'll be spending a few weeks uh, engaging with these concepts. So this is just the first part of the dynamics part of the course. Now dynamics uh, has multiple uh, components to it, uh, but we're going to start out by investigating just the nature of forces and the applications of Newton's law. In the first part of the course, we learned a lot about the mathematics of describing how objects move. That was the study of kinematics. Kine is uh, sort of the Greek root uh, describing motion. And so dynamics now is talking about why those objects move. In particular, as we'll discover, why objects accelerate. And so if we de to develop this, we introduce the idea of a force. This is a physics definition. And we sort of loosely define forces as the interactions between objects that change their motion, which is a little circular, uh, but it's kind of a push or a pull. And uh, we can get actually a little bit more specific about forces and say that all real forces are forces between exactly two objects or between one object and a field. So forces operate pairwise, field and object or between two objects. There aren't sort of three part forces that require things that uh, to have three objects interacting uh, to create a force. Uh, they're always pairwise uh, interactions. Now, there are many types of forces. Uh, they are the, uh, we have contact forces, gravitational forces, tension forces, normal forces, spring forces, friction forces, and field forces. We just sort of list all of these forces, and these are the things that we will engage with in Physics 144 and one uh, later on in Physics 146. Uh, sort of the weirdest one on here are the ideas of these field forces, uh, because it allows uh, forces to come up without objects actually being in contact with each other. And so usually you see that the force is related to the separation between uh, an object that creates a field and the object that is sort of feeling the field of that object. And we have some experience with that, with gravity, electricity, and magnetism. And you've probably interacted with or experienced some of the physics of these forces before. Uh, and so, you know, here's a diagram of the electric field around a point, a positive point charge uh, near a conductor uh, down here. And uh, this is actually a very interesting kind of field force because almost all of the forces that we saw on the previous slide those are almost secretly entirely electric forces or electrostatic forces. So to explore that idea a little more detail, uh, we want to think about matter. Matter is this kind of soup of positive and negative charges. And, you know, matter is made of atoms. Atoms have positive nuclei and electron clouds around them. And I kind of illustrate that here with uh, some positive charges shown in red and a sort of a soup of negative charges shown here in blue. And ordinary matter of two objects shown here and here um, has those two uh, charges co-located on an atomic level. Uh, but if we bring those objects close to each other, what happens is that the positive charges get forced close to each other and the negative charges come along. And the positive charges are sort of locked into a lattice-like structure. They're in, or if it's a, say, a crystal or just kind of in the, physic, uh, the physical object uh, that is, you know, the, the matter itself. Um, and so those are the atomic nuclei. The electrons are much more free to move. They're moving around the sort of the sort of network of positive atomic nuclei. And so when they get close to each other, 
the, po uh, the negative charges in one object sort of respond to the negative charges in the other object, and like charges repel. So they move to the opposite sides of the two objects coming together. The atomic nuclei don't have this liberty. Uh, they are kind of locked into the structure of matter. And so what this does is there, it induces a small charge separation. And so the electric, uh, the negative uh, charges, the electrons, move away, kind of exposing a little bit of positive charge. We call this process polarization. And then those positive charges repel. And so the actual force, if we're actually trying to touch two objects together, the force that we're feeling here is actually the repulsive force between these polarized electric surfaces. This is all happening at the atomic level. And so this uh, actual contact forces are really at their heart, these uh, kind of repulsive electric forces. So we'll be dealing with all of this. And it's kind of interesting because that illustrates that everything that we sort of discussed right here, the sort of forces of the atomic uh, interactions in matter are really electric forces and sort of boils down that like, you know, friction and normal forces and all those things, they're just electricity. And this kind of points to the basic idea that there are really only a few forces in the universe, despite us discussing normal forces and spring forces and friction and drag. All of those are electric and other forces kind of fall into broader categories. And there are only four fundamental forces in the universe. Uh, they are gravity, electromagnetism, and then the strong and weak nuclear forces. And we are exploring and understanding the nature of the, um, the sort of first two forces here in introductory physics. We're really going to be focusing on gravity and electromagnetism, and we start out doing what we like to call classical theory, which is the theory that was developed starting with uh, Newton, um, back in the 17th century and moving on until about the early 20th century. These were very well developed through, uh, for gravity, say through Newtonian gravitation. At the end of the 19th century, there was this excellent theory of electromagnetism called Maxwell's theory of electrodynamics. And this introduced the idea and sort of rounded out the ideas of classical theory. Uh, these are things that involve calculus that involve fields, continuous motions of particles, all of these things work really well. The gravitation was amended and in fact generalized by Einstein in the early 20th century through the process of general relativity, but that's still a classical theory. Um, Classical theory is in contrast to quantum theory. And quickly after uh, general relativity, physics developed the ideas of quantum uh, to sort of explain the behavior of the atomic, uh, on the atomic scale of matter. And these theories uh, are kind of inconsistent with classical theory. It's a very different form of mathematics. But nonetheless, you can view electromagnetism through a quantum lens in a theory called quantum electrodynamics. This is actually an incredibly well-developed theory that describes how a lot of the universe works, and it works well at the regular scales and at the subatomic scales where quantum matter Works. So it's a really beautiful theory here. And those quantum theories also were able to explain a lot of the behaviors of atomic parts of matter uh, through the strong and weak nuclear forces, which were purely quantum theories. There were no classical, component, uh, classical equivalents of these uh, theories. And theoretically, we can actually view electromagnetism and the weak nuclear force uh, in terms of something that's called electroweak theory, which is a superset of quantum electrodynamics, including the effects of the weak nuclear force. 
uh, we can describe how the particles in atomic nuclei interact through a uh, different branch of quantum physics called quantum chromodynamics. And so this kind of suggests that all of the four forces are developed ideas with quantum mechanics. Uh, and therefore, gravity should be quantum. Um, we do not have a quantum theory of gravity right now. It's been many decades of hard work and nobody has developed a complete uh, theory of gravitation that includes quantum uh, physics, but we believe that such a theory should exist. And so it's an active way that we want to develop our ideas here in physics. But the high level point is to remember that all of the forces in the universe really boil down to these four and we'll be dealing primarily with the interactions of gravity and electromagnetism under classical theory at the beginning and then by learning how these theories work the quantum theories can uh, make much more sense because the compare and contrast gives you a lot of insight as to what's happening in the quantum world okay uh, putting this awesome future physics on hold, uh, we can return to the idea of forces. Uh, the next thing that we know about forces is that forces act as vectors. So this immediately justifies, well, why did we introduce the mathematics of vectors? And that's because forces are things that come with directions. That means that forces combine as vectors using vector addition. So I show sort of this force in red, pushing down on a scale and then what the scale is going to read. If we push with one force, you get an answer of five Newtons. Two forces uh, add vectorially to give you a larger force that's twice as big uh, and 10 Newtons. And then if I sort of tilt the forces, the only thing that the scale responds to is the vertical components of those forces. And so we consider the vector addition of those in the vertical direction, and that will give me an answer that depends on trigonometry of the 8.7 Newtons. The horizontal components of those forces uh, cancel out. And then we describe how matter interacts with the forces using Newton's laws. So law, Newton's laws are physical laws. Uh, and it's interesting to sort of describe laws versus theory because it's not necessarily an idea that's well developed uh, earlier in your education. Uh, so I just want to note that Physical laws are the things that uh, describe the way the universe works when we observe it time and time again. In general, laws are fundamental relations that are developed empirically. That means by studying the universe around us and making predictions. Laws are not theories. Theories are well-developed mathematical systems that predict the behaviors of the universe possibly including physical laws. So I'm going to be describing Newton's laws of motion. They are not uh, necessarily a theory of motion. It doesn't explain why these things happen, but it does give you an answer for how the universe works. And so the first law is called, you know, Newton's first law describes what happens if there are no net forces on an object. If there are no net forces, then an object does not accelerate. So it either remains at rest or it is moving at a constant velocity. And that means a vector velocity here. So not a constant speed, but a vector uh, velocity. It doesn't change direction either. And it comes with some fine print that we kind of implied last in the previous videos. Uh, which is, this only works if you are in an inertial reference frame. And so if we're studying these objects with respect to the, uh, say, a stationary frame of reference on the Earth, there can be no acceleration between your reference frame and sort of the stationary frame of uh, the Earth or the universe. And so you don't apply Newton's law to an object when you or the object are attached to something that is accelerating. So if you are moving with a constant velocity, still in an inertial reference frame, but it's good to define inertial reference frames by identifying the things that aren't. 
So these are two examples of non-inertial reference frames. Uh, the first one is a linearly accelerating reference frame. Let's say you're embedded in this truck that's accelerating down the road, and you notice this mass from the ceiling sort of deflects backward with no obvious force on it. So it has not remained at rest with, uh, instead, it is apparently deflected for no apparent reason, apart from you, know, you being embedded in this accelerating reference frame. So this means that Newton's laws can't apply because there's these forces that are kind of showing up, or these, these accelerations that are showing up out of nowhere with no obvious force associated with them. Over here is a rotating reference frame, and it's kind of showed in two perspectives. Uh, from the top, this is an inertial reference frame. It's a top-down view of a rotating disk with a little ball on it and then a little reference marker right here. And so what's going to happen is that this ball is just going to be pushed out towards this little red market here. In the bottom is being locked in the rotating reference frame where this little dot, say an observer, is going to be kind of fixed in one place. And as I play this uh, animation, what you're going to see is two different perspectives on the motion. In the inertial reference frame, the ball just rolls on a straight line downward. But if you're inside this rotating reference frame, the ball starts rotating, moving towards you, but then kind of deflects out of the way as the platform spins. And so if you're this observer here at the red dot, you're seeing this football move with no obvious reason. It just deflects away. So you're not in an inertial reference frame. Uh, so this is called the Coriolis effect and it shows up in rotating references, uh, re reference frames for moving objects. Okay, so Newton's laws may seem obvious to you, but you got to understand where they were uh, coming from, which is Newton replaced Aristotelian physics, and a tenet that described motion under Arist Aristotle's physics is that all bodies move to their natural space, upward or downward, depending on their nature. And so this is just kind of weird. It's certainly not mathematical, and it doesn't make a lot of deep predictions, but it's the way that people described the universe. And really, it's just because there's friction and drag, and it seemed like all objects on Earth just would naturally come to rest over time uh, because that's what was observed. And it really wasn't until Newton was studying celestial mechanics where you don't have the effects of drag that it kind of occurred and was inspiring that maybe there was something on Earth that was unique and that the universe as a whole operated differently. Okay, so um let's return and recap newton's first law uh it's really a good framework for identifying inertial reference frames if the first law is broken you know you're not in an inertial reference frame but formally uh newton's first law is a corollary of the second law which we'll get there uh so when we say a body at rest tends to stay at rest and the body at motion tends to stay in motion that's just testing whether we're in an inertial reference frame Okay, next step is the second law, but first we have to describe how forces relate to accelerations. And the key idea here is the idea of mass in an object. The more massive an object, the more uh, force is required to make it accelerate, or, proportion, or equivalently, the less a given force will make it accelerate. So more massive objects accelerate less if you push on them with the same force. So there's this idea of mass in physics that is the resistance to acceleration. And it's not obvious that this is true, but empirically the laws of the universe are that this is the equivalent to a measure of how much matter is in an object literally the count of subatomic particles inside an object is how you figure out what its mass is more on mass in a little bit but um we have this idea of mass and it's basically the amount of stuff in an object 
And that allows us to write down what Newton's second law is, which tells us that the sum of forces on an object is the mass times the acceleration. A few things to note. First, vector equation. Forces are vectors, accelerations are vectors, vector equation. Um, the thing on the left-hand side is telling us what is happening to an object, and the thing on the right side is telling us how that object is responding to it if it has a mass of m. The uh, first time we encounter in Physics 144, the idea of a compound unit is here. It is the Newton, uh, and so it is the SI unit of force, um, and it's a compound unit, which is just determined by balancing units in this equation. Dimensional analysis tells us a Newton is a mass times an acceleration, or a kilogram times a meter per second squared. So that is how we define a Newton. So we use that as a shorthand for uh, what's happening physically. Next, let's explore the vector nature of this equation. Uh, it holds in all directions. So it's a compact way of writing three equations. Some of the forces in the x direction is the mass times the acceleration in the x direction. Same thing for y and for z. And so it also tells us that if we look at vectors, things like this uh, indicate that we can have a case of statics where if we have a pi, so indicated because there's a pi on it, uh, and we have forces balanced here as vectors, if the x and the y components of these forces balance in both directions uh, and sum together to be zero, the acceleration will be zero, and then the pi won't accelerate. Similarly, if we change the direction of the force, all of the magnitudes remain the same, uh, we can find out that the pi will accelerate. So we do the same thing and we break down our vectors into their components and carrying out the sum of the forces in both directions. The sum of the forces in the x direction is minus 8.7 newtons in the negative x direction, 7.1 newtons in the positive x direction, gives us a net force of minus 1.6 newtons in the x direction. In the y direction, it's going to be 7.1 up, 5 down, so it's a net force of 2.1 newtons in the plus y direction. And so that tells us the components of the force vector and the direction of the net force vector is what tells us where the pi will accelerate. So the kinematics are going to say that the pi is going to shoot off in this direction with a net force uh, set by these two components. The final thing with Newton's laws is that all forces come in pairs. This is Newton's third law. And I'm going to it's often stated colloquially as for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, but there's a much better equation for it, which I'm going to write as this, which basically says that when one object A exerts a force on another object B, there is an equal and opposite force exerted by B on A. And so I'm using this notation here that uh, FAB refers to the force of object A on object B. And that means that it is going to have an equal and opposite, uh, so the negative uh, vector of force of B on A. And so it's useful to sort of keep track of uh, the force. Uh, the first part is what is pushing, and the second part is what is receiving that. Okay, few rules about Newton's third law. It's very, it is hands down the hardest of three Newtons, uh, of the three Newton law. So first off, these action-reaction pairs, these equal and opposite forces, always act on different objects. We'll talk about drawing free body diagrams later, but they never appear on the same free body diagram. Second thing is that action-reaction pairs are always the same kind of force. If it's a normal force or a contact force, the uh, action reaction is a contact force. If one's a friction force, the other's a friction force. If one is weight, the other is weight. Uh, or, you know, there are two gravitational forces. One is gravity, the other is gravity. So they're always the same type of force. And finally, they always have the same magnitude 
opposite directions, same magnitude. So this raises the question. If everything has an equal and opposite force, how does anything move at all? Well, the key to this is to come back to the idea that these action-reaction pairs act on different objects. So that's important because while the forces between two objects are the same, the accelerations are going to be different because the masses are different. If you are walking along the ground, there is a friction force that allows you to walk. That friction force is you pushing back on the earth. And then the equal and opposite friction force of the earth pushing on you is what's going to move you forward. You move forward given that force, but the earth is much more massive than you. So its acceleration is smaller by 22 orders of magnitude and therefore you don't notice it, even though you do give the Earth a tiny little acceleration back. So you move with respect to the Earth because the masses are different, even though the forces are the same. Final thing to note is that we are in calculus land. And so we remember that when I write down F, the sum of forces is equal to ma, a is the time derivative of the velocity vector or the second time derivative of the position vector. And so that allows us to start to introduce the ideas of kinematics clearly into forces. It's kind of interesting. Why did we stop at the second derivative? Like we could take a third derivative of position. Uh, that's called the jerk. Uh, or you take the fourth derivative, which I believe is the snap. The fifth derivative is the crackle, and the sixth derivative is the pop. Those six derivatives, you can take as many derivatives as you want for a lot of our functions. But why do we stop at two? And that's because that is the law of the universe. Forces create accelerations. They don't change velocity or they don't create velocities. They do not create jerks. They create accelerations. And so that's why we stop at two time derivatives. It's just the law of the universe. Okay. These force methods with calculus are going to allow us to explore a lot of interesting additional techniques for our physics, which is later on, we'll talk about the work energy. Well, that's just force and calculus acting over distance. There's impulse momentum, and that's force plus calculus acting over time. And then there's rotational motion, which is forces, but on big objects. But all of this is the core of the physics that we need to do in this class comes here from these three Newton's laws. So we're there. We've introduced the core physics, and now let's explore it. So I think the first thing I'd like to explore is the idea of how to introduce calculus and F equals ma. So let's think about if the particle is moving with a trajectory uh, given by this vector equation, and it has a mass m, what is the net force of the particle as a function of time? And just express your answer in terms of a, b, c, d, and m. Well, if we do that, um, all we have to do is recognize that this up here is the position of the particle. And so what we'd really like to do is figure out the acceleration. We first calculate the velocity vector as the time derivative of the position with respect to time. And that is something that we take component-wise. We take the time derivative of the first component. Uh, so that's going to be 3at squared minus b times t. Uh, oh, sorry, minus b, because we take the time derivative of the t, it cancel, it goes away, it becomes t to the 0 in the i-hat direction, plus ct to the 4th, the derivative of that is 4ct cubed in the j-hat direction. And then for a trig function, we apply the chain rule. We take the derivative of the sine, which is a cosine. That's not something I'm expecting you to know directly yet. I'm just asserting it. And then we take the time derivative of whatever's inside. The time derivative of dt is just d. And so we're left with d cosine of dt k hat. Ooh, so far, so good. 
Let's take the acceleration. That's the time derivative of the velocity vector. And so then that is uh, time derivative of 3at squared is 6at. Uh, time derivative of b is 0. It's a constant. So 6at times i hat plus uh, 4ct cubed. Take the time derivative of that. We get 12ct squared. Uh, that's j hat. And then the time derivative of um, the cosine is negative sine. And then I take the time derivative of what's inside. That gives another d. So this becomes negative d squared times sine dt k hat. Okay. And so then if I want to figure out the force, the force, the sum of the forces, is equal to the mass times the acceleration. And so I just multiply a mass through by every term. So it's 6 mat i hat plus 12 m c t squared j hat minus d squared m sine dt k hat. And we're done. Take two time derivatives and out comes uh, the and multiply by mass, and that gives us the sum of the forces. All right, so that's just how we would deal with things in terms of calculus. We are going to move into vectors. And so the way we analyze systems always kind of follows the same core method, uh, which we're going to describe by first creating free body diagrams. We'll talk about those in a moment. Uh, the second is we choose coordinate systems. We write down f equals ma along the different directions of that of the selected coordinate systems. And then we solve these systems of equations for unknowns. Well, um, I want to emphasize step three here. Because in this class, the system that I will use is I'm going to rely on the coordinate systems and the free body diagrams to specify the directions of the forces with signs. And then the variables I'll be working with are going to typically be the magnitudes of the forces. So we will solve and identify magnitudes and we will use coordinate systems and drawings and the um, sort of free body diagram structure to actually tell us the vector direction and reconstruct that at the end. Okay, so let's start by talking about what free body diagrams are. Uh, here is a delightful image of a book resting on a table. Um, and so there's lots and lots of forces running around in this system. I've identified electric normal forces in blue and gravity in um, uh, black, and there's all these different components here. So there's a force of the table on the earth, the force of the earth on the table, there's a force of a table on a book, and a force of a book on a table, force of the earth on a book, that's gravity, force of the book on the earth, that's also gravity, earth on table, table on earth. So we have all of these forces, possibly too many forces to be useful, uh, and so if we want to study the book, we draw what's called a free body diagram, where we identify an object and find all of those forces that are acting on the book. So practically, if they're acting on the book, they have a book in the second letter. So it's force of blank on book. And there's two of them. There's FTB, that's that normal force. And we have FEB, that's the weight. And so we draw a little point representing our book, and then we draw the two force vectors attached to it. Force of table on book, force of earth on book. And then we can use the uh, sum of forces in the y direction, if it's just sitting there, set that equal to zero, and analyze this particular system. So let me stress again that we use the variables in terms of their magnitudes of the forces, and then we use signs and coordinate systems to keep uh, the directions straight. So we require establishing a coordinate system for this system to work. So we'll always try to be very explicit about what's happening with that. Okay, so we have this huge list of forces that we could possibly be dealing with. 
here in Physics 144. And today I want to focus on the first three in this list, and we'll come back and deal with four, five, and six in the next part of the course. So let's start out with talking about gravity. Every massive object in the gravitational field of our planet feels the force that I will call weight. It is gravity pulling the object down towards the Earth. So this is how we define down. It's the way our gravitational field is oriented. Weight uh, always has a magnitude of mass of the object times the local gravitational acceleration, and it always points downward. If we define plus y to be going up, then the force of gravity is always going to have the form of minus mg in the y direction. Or in the absence of other forces, then we would say that negative mg is the mass times the acceleration of, the y, of y, and so everything will accelerate downward at g. That's how we define our gravitational acceleration. Now, more generally, uh, you may have seen a form of Newton's law of, or gravitation, which says this is g times the mass of the Earth. This is why astronomers like me like to draw the Earth, a little O with a plus in it. Uh, mass of Earth times the mass of the object divided by r squared. So if we have the mass of the Earth, r is the distance from the center of the Earth to the object, and then um, uh, m is the mass of the little object, and it acts in a opposite direction of this radial offset. Uh, so there's a little negative sign. It's an attractive force pulling it. If we then define that radius vector r to be the distance to the edge of the Earth, the surface of the Earth, plus a little bit more that I'll call y. So if little r is the radius of the Earth plus y, and then y is much, much less than the radius of the Earth, then I can rewrite my magnitude of this force as gmm over r plus y quantity squared, or if I pull out g mass of earth over the radius of the earth squared, pull that out into one term, I get a second term that is 1 over 1 plus y over r of earth quantity squared, and then I get the mass of the object that's being pulled downward. Now, if the height is small compared to the radius of the Earth, which is 6,378 kilometers, if, it, if you're falling a centimeter, it is small, so that one plus a centimeter over 6,000 kilometers, quantity squared, is going to be a number that is very, very tiny. It'll differ from one by about a part in 10 to the 18. Then you say this is approximately equal to one. And so this thing will just multiply away to nothing. And then you get a jumble of constants, g mass of the planet over the radius of the planet squared times m. And we can combine these to get the gravitational acceleration. If you go and you look up the mass of the Earth and the radius of the Earth and all that, you find that g is 9.798 meters per second squared. But we have adopted a standard gravity unit, which is 9.80665 meters per second squared, because the Earth is a little non-spherical and it's also spinning and they've picked a characteristic latitude where this gravitational constant is true. Uh, and so we simply adopt this as a standard of gravity, but it does vary by a couple percent over the surface of the Earth. So your local gravity will be different from the standard gravity, but we really only want to remember one for most of our uh, purposes. Okay, that's weight and gravity. The next thing I want to talk about is normal forces. Um, so what is a normal force really? Um, I want you to sort of consider this edge on perspective of a crappy uh, table. Uh, and I'm going to put an object on it. And so what's happening when I put it on this flimsy little table is the object, the table will deform a little bit. And so the internal structure of the table is going to resist this object on it, and it's going to push back on it. If I push more object, uh, uh, put more force on it, it's going to deflect more, and it's going to push back on it. 
Uh, and so the force is going to act what we call normal to the surface, which means it is perpendicular to the surface. So that's why we call them normal forces. Uh, that normal force can be larger than a surface can maintain and it will break, but otherwise that normal force provides exactly enough force to balance the forces that bring them into being. So it will basically deform to a point where the object comes to equilibrium. So the normal force will balance however hard the object is pushing down on it. So the normal force will therefore change in magnitude so that the surface does not accelerate. And so the object remains on the surface. Okay, the next type of forces I wanna talk about are tension forces. And initially in this class, we will deal mostly with massless ropes uh, or massless cables or objects. They will often be called light cables, which just means ignore the mass. Um, so what a string or a rope or a cable it does is it exerts tension. And what that does is if I pull on one end of a rope, the other end will pull with the same magnitude on an object and the force is going to be the tension force that's within a rope. Now, since the force is massless, uh, that allows us to essentially transmit forces through systems, which is a weird way of putting it. But it, um, the massless means that the tension does not vary through the rope. So consider this, there's a rope here, there's a little blue section that we're gonna analyze. It's massless, but I'm going to imagine that it's being pulled on with two tension forces, T1 and T2, in this coordinate system in the X and the Y direction. And T2 and T1 are pulling in opposite directions uh, from each other. So the difference between those is going to specify the mass times the acceleration. Since it's massless, m is zero, and so those two tensions must be equal uh, to each other. And so that's why the tensions are the same all along a massless rope. It also tells you that the tensions must vary on a massive rope. Okay, so uh, the tension on a rope basically is going to always pull towards the center of uh, the rope. Uh, so in this case, I have a cow suspended from a ceiling, and from that cow I've attached a bag of wasabi peas, and there's a massless rope between them. The tension in that cable is going to pull up on the wasabi peas and down on the cow. And so these two blue arrows are going to kind of pull together. They are largely keeping the uh, uh, rope pulling in the same direction. Uh, so if, uh, and since the rope is massless, the tension magnitudes will be the same, even if uh, the directions are different. Similarly, we'll often deal with pulleys in this part of the class. If they are massless, again, something will relax later. Uh, all they do is they change the directions of forces, but not their magnitudes. And so this redirects the direction of a tension force. Um, we also will encounter the idea of constrained accelerations. We'll explore this in a little more detail later. Uh, but we often use ropes and pulley systems to connect objects together physically, and so their accelerations will have the same magnitude, but not necessarily the same direction here. So here, object one and two will have different directions they are accelerating in, even though the magnitude of those accelerations are going to be related to each other. In this case, they'll be equal, but in some systems, they are simply mathematically related. Okay, so to summarize, gravity is a neat force. It has a very clear formula here near the surface of the Earth. The force is mass times the local gravitational acceleration, g. Uh, tension and normal forces do not have formulas. They are instead set by the problem. They are called constraint forces, which means they are set by what needs to happen to make what we are observing in a problem true. 
And so we'll often just have a set where we will be able to analyze and determine what the tensions and normal forces are based on the physics within the problem. Okay, let's start putting all this blah blah to the work. Let's consider what happens if we have a cheese wheel. It's sitting on top of a scale inside of an elevator. Classic physics experiment. I hope you get to do this in lab. Um, if that elevator is traveling upward at a constant speed of two meters per second, what does the scale read? And for these problems, I'm going to make the math a little easier by taking g to be 10 meters per second squared. Well, let's use the method. First, I'm going to define a y coordinate that is going upward uh, here. And therefore, uh, I have to ask, what is the acceleration? Well, it's a constant speed of two meters per second. So the force, or so the acceleration is zero, and therefore the sum of the forces in the vertical direction are zero. Well, what forces are involved? I'm going to examine the cheese. There are two forces that are acting on it. We have the force upward from a scale, that's the normal force. And then we have the weight pulling downward of gravity on the, on the cheese. And so in the coordinate system I've defined, which is y is going upward, then the normal force uh, is uh, positive. mg is negative. I'm using the coordinate system is going in the negative y direction. So we write down the magnitude of the weight is minus mg. So n minus mg is the zero acceleration. And I can just solve n equals mg. And so that's 150 newtons. Well, that tells us how hard the force on the scale is pushing upward. Uh, on the cheese, but I wanted to know what the scale read. Well, this comes to a model that we will use here in physics, which is scales are measuring the magnitude of the normal force that their surface exerts. So it's simply saying that the scale reads n. Whatever normal force the force of the scale is pushing up on, that's what it's going to read as its measurement. Okay. Let's do a slightly less trivial uh, example, which is the same cheese wheel, but now we are accelerating upward at a speed of two meters per second squared. Uh, what does the scale read? Well, in this case, I'm going to do uh, the same thing uh, as before. I'm going to set up my free body diagram with the normal force and the weight on the cheese, I'm going to define my coordinates to be y direction is upward. We know that the sum of the forces in the y direction are going to be the mass of the cheese times the acceleration in the y direction, which is specified in the problem. And so we know that the normal force minus mg is equal to the mass times the acceleration. It's accelerating upward. If it was saying accelerating downward, I'd put a negative sign on the acceleration. Uh, but I've defined y to be positive in the upward direction, hence the magnitudes work out. And so what I'm solving for remains the normal force. And so that's mass uh, the weight times the mass times the acceleration. I'm going to hop on down underneath here. And so the normal force is equal to the mass times g plus the acceleration is equal to 15 kilograms times the gravitational acceleration, 10 meters per second squared, plus 2 meters per second squared. So that's 12 times 15, or 180 newtons. So if the elevator is accelerating upward, the scale is going to be reading a higher value of 180 newtons. Okay. So now, Sometimes I just want to go on a little sidebar here very briefly. Um, sometimes your physics book or other discussions will refer to what is the apparent weight of the cheese, which is sort of what it see, what the scale reads or something like that. Or it will discuss things that are weightless. Um, I find these to be imprecise and sometimes misleading. And so I'm just going to, uh, in this class, typically refer to weight is the force of gravity usually from the earth on an object. Therefore, something that is weightless only becomes true in the deep space between galaxies where the gravitational field is essentially zero. 
I prefer the term free fall. So in uh, space, you are often in free fall, but there is plenty of gravity around. Uh, and that's going to be very important for uh, understanding uh, things like orbits and things. Finally, uh, the apparent weight is what I will simply call the magnitude of the normal force exerted by the surface of the scale on an object. Uh, I'm just going to call it the normal force. Uh, so I don't like to use apparent weight because it's just not uh, like weight is the force of gravity. And uh, I prefer to avoid sort of the modifications on it. Okay. The next uh, sort of key example that I'd like to do is uh, this one, where I consider two blocks of masses three and five kilograms, respectively, uh, being pushed with a constant force of 40 newtons. The blocks remain in contact during acceleration. I'd like to know what is the acceleration of the system and what is the magnitude of the contact force of A on B and what is its value? Uh, so uh, here we have this setup, and I want to sort of go through all of this in kind of the gory detail, finding the acceleration and the contact force. Now, sometimes in physics, you're sort of taught a different route for uh, doing this problem. I want to work through it using the method, um, because that way uh, I won't accidentally screw up our existence at some point in the future. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider my uh, two blocks here, where I have a block, and I have A, and I have block B. I know that the mass of A is equal to 3 kilograms. The mass of B, deceptively uh, smaller, is 5 kilograms. And we're pushing on this whole system with a force, and that force has a magnitude of 40 newtons. Okay, so with this as our setup, what I do is I draw, I first set up a coordinate system. I'm going to set up the one that was sort of shown previously, where this is the x direction, and this is the y direction there. And then I'm going to construct free body diagrams. So first for object A, and on object A, there are a bunch of forces. So there is a the force that's actually pushing on it. So I'll call that F. There is the weight of object A. That's shown here. That's the mass of object A times G. There is the normal force that is pushing upward from the table to keep object A where it is. And well, that looks like it might be it. So we'll go on to object B. Right, saying, well. How is object B moving? Well, it has a normal force. Uh-oh, there's two normal forces. So what I'll do now is I will put a little subscript on the normal forces to keep track of them. There's a weight, that's MBG. And then we say, what is uh, accelerating this? Well, there is a contact force of object A pushing on object B. So I'm just going to draw that as F of object A on B. That's making it go forward. Ah, so at this point, alarm bells are going off in my head because I have two objects and I have a force between them. And if I have a force between them, this F of A on B, the other free body diagram must contain the Newton third law pair of force. So it's the force of B on A, and it's equal in magnitude and opposite. So I'm going to draw that right here. So it's pointing in the opposite direction of FAB here, and I'm going to call that F of BA. And I'm going to note that the magnitude of FAB is equal to the magnitude of FBA. And so without the actual vectors uh, attached to them, I will say that F of AB is F of BA, and this is magnitudes only. Directions are opposite. That's gonna become important because I'm gonna write down some equations now. I got myself some coordinates, and uh, I'm going to assert that we don't really care about what's happening in the y direction. This is an X problem only. So I'm going to write down the sum of the forces in the x direction for object A uh, over here. And so I can look at that. I have to find the positive x direction up here uh, to be 
to the right. And so uh, then the force in the positive x direction is F. So I'll write that down as F. And then in the negative x direction, we have FBA pushing. And so I use the negative x direction by writing down the magnitude of the force with a sign on it indicating that it is going opposite my plus x axis. So that's F of B. Okay, so that sets up my uh, first equation, and then that's equal to the mass of object A times the acceleration. Uh, object B is going to have a very similar uh, set of forces. So some of the forces in the x direction for object B is just going to be the force of AB. There is nothing going backwards, and that's equal to the mass of object B times the acceleration. Now I'm going to use the equivalence of these and these two equations to solve and figure out the things that I need to know. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the FAB and substitute it in for FBA because those two magnitudes are equal. And so then I'm going to say that F minus MB times the acceleration is equal to mass A times the acceleration. And then I can solve, and I assign that force is equal to the mass of A plus the mass of B times the acceleration, or then the acceleration is the force over MA plus MB, which is equal to 40 newtons over uh, 3 kilograms plus 5 kilograms, which is going to be equal to 5 meters per second squared. We want to pause here for a moment and just note that sometimes your physics teacher may have instructed you to say if you have a system like this, you can kind of treat it as an aggregate system, consider the force that's pushed on it, and say this is force over the total mass of the system, and that gives me the acceleration, and then find the acceleration that way. That's correct in some cases, but the fine print on that will sometimes screw you. And so be careful uh, when you're doing this. Um, and uh, sometimes you will get in cases where you actually have to care about different forces acting on A and B or additional contact forces between them, in which case this whole system will not work nearly as nicely as uh, you would hope. So, uh, given that, what I would like to do is carry on to figuring out the magnitude of the contact force. Well, that, oops, that's F of AB is the magnitude of the contact force. It's just the mass of B times the acceleration uh, coming entirely from this equation right there. And then that is 5 kilograms times 5 meters per second squared is the 25 newtons. Problem solved. Okay, uh, the next problem I'd like to introduce is that of an amoeba. So I have an amoeba sitting here on an inclined plane. Uh, it has a uh, mass of one nanogram. The angle is 60 degrees, diagram so very not to scale. And I'd like to know the magnitude of the normal force of the ramp acting on the amoeba, and what is the acceleration of the amoeba down the ramp? So those are our two goals in doing this. And uh, this is kind of a classic problem of something sitting on an inclined plane. Uh, I'd like to start out by constructing a coordinate system for the amoeba, and I'm going to choose a coordinate system that is parallel and perpendicular to the amoeba's plane of motion. So I'm going to pick an NT coordinate system. This is our wonderful way of using that, where there's a tangent component and a normal component along and perpendicular to the plane of motion. And so that's going to give me a lovely coordinate system where I can carry out my F equals MA. Uh, I have a force on the amoeba, uh, or I have some forces on the amoeba, and I'm going to write down the free body diagram for that. I have two forces. I have the weight of the amoeba, mass times G, and then I have a normal force. And that normal force is acting perpendicular to the surface of the plane, normal force. And if I then want to decompose this into 
my nt coordinates. So I'll draw those in red to indicate that they are coordinates and not vectors. I'm going to have to do a little bit of trigonometry. So at this point, we can do that math. Um, we know how this works. Uh, this is our diagram. Uh, we need to kind of break down uh, this weight vector here into the nt coordinates. And so the geometry of this is that the uh, dotted triangle that I'm drawing here and the overall blue triangle are geometric in the sense of, or similar in the sense of geometry. So there is a similarity relationship uh, between them. And so I want to figure out how to relate the angle on the plane to the angle between the vectors and the NT coordinate system, which is kind of drawn along these two legs of the triangle. And this through doing the argument that this is theta and this is the complement of that angle and these two things are similar, we can figure out that the angle here is going to be 90 minus theta. And so this triangle here, this other angle here must be theta. So there's a little geometric proof that allows us to walk the angle around and find out the right direction here. Uh, but I always like to solve this by kind of imagining a limiting case. And if I imagine the limiting case, I can sort of figure out what happens if the ramp's angle changes and it got smaller. Then you ask of these two angles, the theta or, or the angle here and the angle here, which one also gets smaller? And so in my mind, I always consider this limiting case of it's going to sort of shrink down here. And as this angle gets smaller, this angle gets smaller. And so that's going to help me when I'm doing my geometric deep projections to make sure I always get the right angle. Okay. Let's return to the uh, problem at hand where I am then trying to decompose this into NT coordinate systems. So I'm going to be considering the vectors projected into this and the normal force is already in that coordinate system. That's why we picked it. The normal force is shockingly in the normal direction. But then the weight is going to have to decompose into two components here. There's going to be a component in the normal direction and a component in the tangent direction. And we just argued that this was theta uh, based on the geometry of the problem, and that's the same value as this theta here. And therefore, if I consider my trig, this component here is going to mg cos theta, and this component here is going to mg sine theta. Then we can write down our uh, force relationship. So the force of the sum of the forces in the normal direction is going to be the plus direction is going to be the normal force, and then the minus direction is going to be minus mg cos theta. By the constraints of the system, the uh, amoeba accelerates down the ramp, so its normal acceleration is zero, so it's going purely in the tangent direction. So this is zero, so that means that my normal force is equal to mg cos theta, and then I can plug in the values here. So that is one nanogram, which is 10 to the minus 12 kilograms. So a nano to a kilo is 10 to the nine and then another three orders of magnitude. So that gives me 10 minus 12 kilograms. G is 10 meters per second squared. And then the cosine of 60 degrees is a half. And so this comes out to be five times 10 to the minus 12 or five, let's draw that five like a five pico newtons. Pico being 10 to the minus 12. Okay, uh, then we wanna know what the acceleration is down the ramp. That's the sum of the forces in the tangent direction. Uh, there's only one force that is mg sine theta. And so that's equal to the mass times the acceleration in the tangent direction. And so then I can cancel out the masses. Red, mass, mass. And so the acceleration in the tangent direction is just going to be G, uh, sorry, uh, boop. Uh, uh, 
So the acceleration, the tangent direction is g sine theta, which is 10 meters per second squared times the sine of 60 degrees, which is root 3 over 2, or uh, about uh, 0.87 multiplied by 10 gives me 8.7 meters per second squared. Okay, uh, so this sets up a common ramp problem that we like to see and explore a lot. Okay, uh, we have a few more cases to consider here. Uh, the last one is uh, these pulley systems. And so what I'd like to know uh, in this case is uh, a scenario where uh, we want to solve a problem like this. Consider this pulley system, which is being used by somebody to raise a big bag of wasabi peas, 100 kilograms, uh, upward at a constant speed. What is the magnitude of the force they are pulling on the rope with? Well, uh, this is a kind of interesting problem to start because there are um, this uh, system here. And I want to analyze it in a little bit of detail uh, because these pulley systems can get kind of tricky. I want to consider this uh, rope here. Uh, if I'm pulling down on it with a force F, that means that throughout the rope, there is a tension force that's equal to F. So everywhere along here, there's a tension in the rope that is equal to the force. So that's what I mean. The magnitude of the tension is equal to force. And I want to start by analyzing the forces on this pulley system here. There is a tension here that is not the same rope as this rope that's running along here. So for this pulley, so let's consider the pulley. Oops. That pulley, I have a tension, two, a tension force on this side of the tension force, or this side of the pulley, there's a tension force up. And on this side of the pulley, there's also a tension force up. So there are two, oops, there are two tension forces moving upward, T and T. There is a second rope here that's actually pulling on the wasabi peas. And I'm going to call that tension T2. So it's pulling down with T2. That pulley is massless. So for the pulley, the sum of the forces, I'm going to be clear that this is the plus y direction is going upward. So some of the forces in the y direction is going to be that the 2t minus t sub 2 is equal to the mass times the acceleration of the pulley. Pulley is massless, so this is 0. And so therefore, 2t is equal to t sub 2. So this uh, rope right here has a tension in it that is twice the force. Um, so let me go ahead and say that T2 has a magnitude of 2F. Next, I want to consider the free body diagram on the P's themselves. That has T2 pulling up, F, or sorry, MG is pulling down. The sum of those forces is going to be zero because they are moving upward at a constant speed. So we know that T2 minus mg is equal to zero. So T2 equals mg. And so that's 2f that's equal times mg. I know what uh, the mass of the wasabi peas is. And so f must be equal to the mass of wasabi peas, 100 kilograms, times the acceleration due to gravity, 10 meters per second squared, all over two or 500 newtons. So that is a way of solving it. So what's kind of neat about this, uh, and is the reason why people use pulleys, is that pulling on one end with a force F uh, is going to end up pulling upward on the wasabi peas with a force of magnitude 2F. And so that allows us to double the force that we're pulling upward on these wasabi peas, and that's basically why there's a field of engineering. So, moving onward. I want to consider what happens if that system is accelerating. 
And so this is a case where we have to pay a little bit more attention to what's happening to two objects in a system uh, where they're linked by a pulley system like this. Well, um, that's kind of uh, tricky because uh, this rope here is moving at kind of a sort of constant speed through here. But then this the wasabi peas are going to be moving at a different rate than the cow uh, or a different magnitude and certainly in a different direction. So I'd like for you to consider here is what happens if the wasabi peas move down. There we go. Go wasabi peas. So move down. So if the cow moves up by some displacement delta y, then the P's are gonna move down by some displacement delta Y over two. And that's because this rope here is going to get shorter by some distance delta Y, but then that slack is going to be taken up on both sides of the pulley equally. And so that's going to divide the slack uh, into two parts, some over here and some over here. And the net effect of that is that the P's only move down by a height of delta y over two. So we know that the time derivative of delta y, the two time derivatives of delta y give me the acceleration. And so that means two derivatives of the P's acceleration are going to give me an acceleration that is half the magnitude of the wasabi P's. Uh, or sorry, the wasabi peas are going to have a magnitude that's half that of the cow. And so to be kind of clear about what's happening, I would mathematically have a relationship that the acceleration of the wasabi peas is going to be equal to half that of the cow. And if the cow moves up, the peas move down. So there must be a negative sign between them if we are considering everything in the uh, vertical direction only. Okay, so we have the idea of constrained accelerations, which we'll explore in a little bit more detail as we go. All right, the final thing I wanna talk about here is a little bit of a tricky example, which is what happens if I have this system here where blocks A and B have masses of A and B respectively, A is greater than B, pulley C, I'm going to label that here, that's C, is given upward, it's going to have the massless ropes and the pulley itself will be massless, and it is somehow accelerating upward at a acceleration of A naught. I'd like to know what uh, the acceleration of the blocks are. Now, you could be very um, keen and sort of say, well, I'm going to consider their accelerations relative to the pulley and apply F equals MA and sort of balance forces over top of the pulley and stuff like that. But the tricky thing about this is this pulley here is not part of an inertial reference frame. The inertial reference frame is watching this whole thing accelerating upward from an external perspective. So we have to apply Newton's laws in the inertial reference frame. So let's start out with the system. The system says, first, let's define a coordinate system. And shockingly, that coordinate system will be that y is increasing in the vertical direction. So uh, we are going to then talk about the height of, the, of one rope. Let's say that that rope is going to be the distance from that B is from the center of the pulley. I'm going to give that a sort of separate variable that I am going to call Y. And I'm going to say that that variable, I don't know what that height is, but I do, do know that I'm going to define D squared Y DT squared to be acceleration of B in the Y direction or in, yeah, in the y direction. And so that's just this additional component uh, there. And so that's, let me call it a sub y b. That's better. Okay, then I'm going to write down my f equals ma. So for the a object, the 
force upward is going to be given by a tension force, and then there's going to be mass of A times G downward. And that's the only forces that are on it. For B, we have a very similar free body diagram. There's a tension force pulling up, and then there's a uh, weight pulling down. The tricky part about this is writing down F equals MA. The sum of the forces are going to be in the y direction for, uh, let's do B first. Uh, the sum of the forces in the y direction for this is going to be T minus MBG is equal to mass of B times the acceleration. And the acceleration is going to be whatever the acceleration of this is with respect to the pulley, plus an additional acceleration of the pulley with respect to the Earth. And so that's going to end up being a naught plus a y b. So that gives us that acceleration. Now these accelerations are linked. So if b is moving upward at acceleration in the y direction, a y b, then the uh, acceleration of a is I'm going to say that it has an acceleration uh, that's up, uh, that is going to be uh, t minus m a times g, and then that's the mass of object a times a naught. And then the trick here is that if the uh, acceleration a y is positive, a y b is positive, a uh, mass of a is going to be moving down at the same acceleration. And so I can say that in the coordinate system that this is minus a y b. And so that's going to give me my uh, two sets of equations. And now it's all over but the algebra. So uh, at this point, I can go ahead and I say, I'm going to solve this equation by um, solving both equations for t and then equating those. I'm going to solve, essentially, yeah, I'm going to say that here, the tension, oops, the tension is equal to mass of A times G is equal to the mass of A times A naught minus A Y B. And then, uh, sorry, uh, that's not a, eh, let's um, erase a little bit. Make that a little cleaner. So that's going to be plus, that's not an equal sign. Uh, the next one is going to be that the tension force here is equal to MBG plus MB times A naught plus AYB. I'll equate these two, and I'd like to uh, isolate for the acceleration AYB. So I'm going to get that this is MAG plus MA times a naught minus a y b is equal to m b g plus m b times a naught plus a y b. Okay, uh, I can solve. I'm trying to solve for these variables. I want them on one side of the equation by itself. So I'm going to push them over to the right side and gather everything else to the left side. So that's equal to m a g minus m b g. Uh, plus M A, uh, sort of distributing here, M A acceleration zero, A, a naught, um, and minus M B times acceleration naught is equal to M A times A Y B plus M B times A Y B. And then um, I'll go ahead and Grab all this math, Oop. copy it, go to our next page. Uh, paste it. There's our math. Okay, a little extra to boot. There we are. There's our math. Uh, let's delete all the crap we got with it and keep solving. Whew, we made it. All right. So 
Uh, I'm going to factor out uh, this. I'm going to pull out an MA minus MB from both terms. B is e times G uh, plus MA minus MB times A naught. And then uh, that's going to come over here. I'm going to factor out an MA plus MB from both terms here. Uh, times a y b, and then I'm going to um, uh, keep factoring over here. This is m a minus m b times g plus a naught uh, is equal to m a plus m b uh, times a y b. Solve for a y b at long last. That is equal to uh, m a minus mb times g plus a naught all over uh, ma plus mb. And then the total acceleration of an object is going to be the a naught. Uh, so we found that the acceleration for object a was going to be a naught minus a y b. And so for example, that's a naught minus ma minus mb times g plus a naught over m a plus m b, okay? And then a sub b is going to be equal to a naught plus a y b, and that is equal to a naught plus m a minus m b times g plus a naught all over m a plus m b. Okay, Whew. lots of algebra, but uh, we do uh, have the capacity to say a little bit more uh, about this. I want to consider a case, and this is a good way to check your math at the end, which is does this make sense in a limit? And the limit that I want to consider here is what happens if, question mark, what if, what if m a equaled m b. And if we return to kind of what that looks like, uh, not the cows and peas, but here, if we return to this uh, case, we would see that these two masses would be equal. And so they would sort of just say fixed there and the whole thing would accelerate upward together at a naught because there's some force that's pulling it upward. Well, does that make sense with the math that we've derived? Well, if ma equals mb, then this difference here is going to be zero. And so then this whole second term will drop off, and I'm just left with the accelerations of both objects being a naught. So that, that makes a lot of sense. I think we're kind of happy with that. Uh, another limit we could consider uh, is what happens if MA is much, much greater than MB. So that then, uh, in that case, what would happen is MA here would dominate this MB term. So this would go to MA. And this MA plus MB, when I add those together, it's about MA. So then these would cancel out. And we would end up with our answer being that the um, B would go upward at uh, to uh, at um, MAG plus twice the acceleration, and then A would go downward, um, this would just go uh, downward at basically minus MG. So essentially A would free fall down, B would rocket upward, um, and we'd end up with a uh, rapidly accelerating uh, system moving upward. So that seems like it would kind of make sense as well. Okay. Uh, so that kind of gives us our uh, two uh, pieces that we could consider here in limiting case, and it also illustrates the care that we need by analyzing this in the non in the inertial reference frame. All right. Uh, so that brings us to the end, at long last, of the dynamics lecture. Uh, we are we're done. We've done a few examples. We've gone over the cases where Newton's law hold, and I think that should wrap it up. Um, if you have any questions, I'll see you in the Discord.